thank heavens the introduction was right. I was thinking, this is not philosophical. Um, this is, I hope, going to be quite practical, so that's great. Um, thank you for that. Um, I was asked to really share some of the work that we're doing in Forum that focus on collaboration to drive system change. And just had a quick introduction to Forum. We're a sustainable development non-profit. Who's actually heard of Forum for the Future in the audience? Oh my goodness, happy days. Um, I'm used to giving talks like this in Singapore and in the US where I ask this question and maybe two people go, I think so, are you the Institute for the Future? Um, I'm a known member of Forum for the Future. So great, um, this slide is probably quite redundant. All of which to say our mission is to catalyze an acceleration towards a sustainable future. And we do that in two main ways. We run projects designed to solve complex sustainability challenges, and then what we call inspiring and equipping change makers to really diagnose the system around them and understand how to drive systemic change. And we do that through the School of Systems Change, amongst other avenues. We also use a lot of futures tools and techniques, because as we've just heard, we would agree the future isn't something that happens to us. There are multiple futures on offer. We do a lot of scenario work, and our belief very much is if we can understand these possible futures, then we can design today for the future that we want. So what I wanted to cover was a little bit about our changing world, and I suspect we're all quite familiar with the messy, complex nature of these trends. So that bit is gonna be really quick. Um, I then want to just explain why at Forum we began to use the language of systems change as a response to this complexity. And then I wanted to talk about collaboration as a means of pulling together different parts of a system to solve specific challenges as a way of accelerating progress in that system. Is that all right? And there'll be time for questions for the end, but if, going through this, I say anything really outlandish or you desperately disagree with, just put your hand up, it's fine. Um, it sometimes happens. So, um, our changing world. What we do at Forum um, through our Future Centre, which is a digital platform where we're scanning for signals of change the whole time, annually we produce a summary of where we think really interesting areas of dynamism are in the world around us, by dynamism, stuff that's moving really quickly and unpredictably and will shape our ability to drive sustainable development. And this year, our publication um, was the first time we brought together all of our futures work with our understanding of how to drive systems change. And that understanding, of course, is evolving the whole time. It's not complete and it's just our best guess as to how we can drive transform transformational change right now. So this is on our website, you can download it. It talks about seven areas of change, um, and I'll just go through a few of them today, just to remind us of the sheer complexity and scale of the challenges that we face, if we needed a reminder, and why, as Forum, we think that this whole framing of systems is the way in which we can begin to manage and respond to this complexity. So, this is very interesting in the, in the space of just a year. We've gone from uh, dialogue, which is, yeah, climate change is really important amongst senior decision makers, particularly in government and in business, to, yeah, there is an emergency. And there really is an emergency <coughs> right now. And I think it's incredible how quickly that understanding has begun to permeate into broader civil society. And so, of course, the first area we focused on at Forum was the climate crisis. And what is encouraging me right now is that we're beginning to understand the links between climate and health and biodiversity and beginning to solve for these issues together rather than viewing them as separate and distinct trends. What I think is also interesting is the way in which this whole conversation around plastics has gone from, again, the niche into the mainstream and certainly here in Europe, legislative changes coming down the pipe the whole time, which means I think we are very close to banning single-use plastics across certainly Europe. It's happening in the US right now. And arguably saving carrier bags isn't really going to drive the change that we want to see, but as a way of engaging everyday citizens in some of these sustainability issues, it's helpful. 
I was at a meeting on Tuesday with the ex-head of DEFRA's um, sustainability policy, and in the meeting, uh, someone from business said, oh yeah, this plastic thing, I, you know, why are we still focused on carrier bags? It's just a distraction. And the lady that used to run sustainability in DEFRA said, it's a gift. People are having the conversation about plastic, so let's use that energy. And even though it's about straws or plastic bags, let's use that energy and that awareness and have a bigger conversation that could drive change. <laughs> Biodiversity in free fall. So if the last 12 months has been a conversation about the climate emergency, the next few months is going to be a conversation about biodiversity. In the same way that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued their start warning on climate change in October of last year, we're going to get the very same set of messages on biodiversity this October. And these stats are not great, and even though the conversation has been around for a while in terms of our dependency on biodiversity, there just seems to have been some unwillingness to accept the reality of that conversation. Nationalism, thank you for the call out to UK citizens. I'm not feeling great at the moment, I have to say. Feeling a little bit better now that our parliamentarians have woken up and done something. But this trend, driven by some really profound sustainable development issues, inequality, lack of access to education, is in a way making it so much harder to do what we need to do. It's undermining our ability to govern internationally. And we need to accept that this is happening. And I realise that I need to stop moaning about Brexit and actually just concentrate even harder on the root causes. Why did this happen? And how do we solve some of those root causes, particularly around inequality, and get really serious about that? Because unless we do that, this is just going to become even more profound. And it is a counterforce to our ability to solve some of the world's issues, because the world's issues are not localized. Some of them are, but the majority are not. The on life, um, we talked about this this year because of the obvious trend around our reliance on digital. But actually, part of what's driven some of the nationalist surge is the whole story around fake news and the ability of quite radical voices to be heard quite quickly. And I think there's a really interesting conversation about how do we harness this technology in a way that drives sustainability rather than perhaps undermines it? And who owns the data? And I just think we're beginning to understand that this is something that we haven't really thought properly about and perhaps we should. And then the fifth trend I just wanted to call up as very deliberate, because I think sometimes here in the UK and in Europe and in the US where I spend quite a bit of time, I certainly have moments where I think we're getting close to a tipping point in dealing with some of these issues around consumerism and the fact that you know, consumerism is driving all sorts of negative impacts in our economy. But go to Asia, and then you see the scale of the challenge, the massive growth of economies in that part of the world, the fact that shopping malls are going up the whole time, and why shouldn't they, in a way? But I think if we are going to be serious about sustainable consumption and production, we have to involve Asia in perhaps a different way. And what's really exciting about what's happening in Asia is the possibility of leapfrogging a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the behaviors that have generated some of the sustainability challenges we're solving for today. So let's not forget what's happening in Asia and let's understand how do we harness that dynamism actually to avoid some of the more negative consequences of development that we've seen here. So there's a lot more, clearly, <coughs> but that's just some of the flavor of the complexity that we're facing today and why at Forum, We've gone from very much working historically solely in one-on-one -on -one relationships with government, with business, with philanthropy, to thinking much more about a systems approach. And Anna Burney, my colleague, is talking this afternoon, and she has this slide too. That's the only slide we have in common. Um, but we use this a lot in our work, and it's not a new quote, it's Donella Meadows. And you know, I use this 
with senior board level directors. And even today, you hear people go, oh, yes, the world is really messy and complicated. And yet we insist on bringing our linear framings, that engineering mindset to solve with these challenges. And then wonder why we don't get to the root cause of the problem. And so for me, this quote is really important in saying, actually, yeah, it is all messy, it is complicated, it blows your mind in terms of complexity. However, if we embrace that interconnectivity, if we embrace that messiness, understand it better, find those points of intervention in the system that can drive catalytic change, then actually we might, we just might begin to solve for some of these challenges. So, Great British saying, teaching grandmother to suck eggs. I don't need to tell you what a system is. But I included this because it gives you a sense of how I think about systems and how Forum also thinks about system, which is very much as a living systems phrase. Now, can anybody tell me what this is here? A June bug. Um, a June bug? Nearly. June bug. Uh, Nearly, actually, it's a really, it's an impossible question. Books, for sure. Um, it's a heather beetle. Um, and the reason I've got a picture of a heather beetle because it's my way of explaining systems. So many, many, many years ago, when I was a budding scientist, my background is as an ecologist, my PhD was looking at the effects of nitrogenous deposition on semi-natural ecosystems. Got that? <laughs> Basically, pollution on sensitive ecosystems. And the reason that I went into that study area was because here in the UK, and particularly in Europe, and particularly lowland Europe in the Netherlands, heathlands, which are dominated by Coluna vulgaris, given that wonderful purple flower, particularly this time of year, they were disappearing and being overtaken by grass, which from a biodiversity point of view wasn't <coughs> great news. And the question was asked, so why is the heather disappearing? And that was really the subject of my PhD. And I spent three years in fields, looking at heather beetles, measuring heathers, then in um, big experimental facilities, blasting heather with different dosages of nitrogen. And what was actually happening is that ammonia from pig farms that were open pig farms was being emitted into the atmosphere, falling down as nitrogen-rich rain, which was then fertilizing, over-fertilizing the soil, which was then making the heather really tasty for the heather beetles, who then just snapped on the heather and then accelerated the transition, which would happen anyway from heathland to grassland. And it's my way of understanding systems. And in this instance, what we began to really understand is if we could solve for the ammonia emissions from the pig farms, then we could stop the acceleration from heathland to grassland. And my research, along with plenty of others, led to a change in legislation. And actually now, the way that we farm our pigs, I'm a vegetarian, so in a way I don't really care, but for those that do eat meat, um, <laughs> it was changed and actually we reduced the nitrogenous emissions and started to stabilize that system. So for me, it's just a great example of what we understand by systems in that all of these parts are interconnected and at any one point in time, there's something happening in a system that's changing it. And if we can understand what's driving that change in the system and harness that change, then we can change the patterning of how that system develops. And so for us at Forum, that's why this notion of systemic change is really powerful. Because if we think about our economy, our society today, it's just a record of our past decisions. It's a record of our past actions. And the systems around us, the social systems, the environmental systems, the economic systems, they're in rapid flux right now. Systems are always changing. As a room right now, we're not seeing much change. Um, you know, you're moving a little bit, but in a moment, the whole room will change when you go out to have your coffee break. So the question then becomes, if a system is constantly changing, how do we then understand the ways in which that system is changing and use that understanding to design for a repatterning of that system that drives the future that we want? And so that really is the theory of change behind a lot of the work we do at Forum is, if we can understand the dynamism in parts of the food system, in parts of the health system, and understand what's driving that dynamism, 
then particularly through collaboration, perhaps we can alter the evolution of that system in a way that then underpins as opposed to undermines sustainable development. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Not that difficult really, is it? But, and you're all experts in this, but this is kind of how we think about how we might design for solutions for sustainable development. And critically for us, it means focusing on stopping designing for incremental change, which is far easier to deliver than transformational change. And so in our work, particularly our collaborations, and I'll come on to this, we're looking for opportunities to drive transformational change. And by transformational change, I mean change that is often global, but not always, but can be global. But for me, quite critically, it's catalytic. So what's that one change we can engineer in a system that then drives change around it? And for an example, we are running, uh, actually we're coming to the end of running, a big collaboration in the global tea industry, as in a cup of tea. Um, the tea industry, like many other global commodity markets, is not sustainable, associated with very poor returns to smallholders, a whole host of environmental and social challenges. And in the tea industry, what we're experimenting with right now with funding from DFID and with some corporate sponsorship is a new market mechanism for trading tea. So, I don't know if you knew this, but fun tea fact, tea on the global market is usually traded. So, um, sorry, auctioned, I beg your pardon. So when there's an oversupply of tea into the market, the price of tea drops, and that means that smallholders, and tea is predominantly still a smallholder business, the smallholders don't get the price of production. And so that then undermines their ability to live sustainably, to invest, and so on and so forth. And so what we're experimenting with is a different market mechanism for trading tea, a mechanism that guarantees a price for the tea, much like the futures market, but in a way that then allows a smallholder a guaranteed rate of return and allows them to invest. And that's a catalytic change, because if that works, then yes, the smallholders can invest in improving farming, becoming climate resilient, in access to education. And so one small change in the market, in this instance, could drive further catalytic impact. And it's working. We found out last week that actually the experiment is working in the auction houses of Nairobi, which is great. Anyway, enough of that. Um, so back to transformational. The other key attribute is that it's self-sustaining. And how many of you have engineered some change in a system around you, be it a social system or your local environment, where the change has begun to make itself felt? And then it just disappeared. Thank you for that. Um, thank you very much. I've had loads of experience of that. You know, we have created all sorts of innovations at Forum with our partners, and we're thinking, this is great, this is going to be really, really brilliant. And then, actually, the inherent power of the system means that it swallows up that change. So how do you design for change that's self-sustaining? It's hard, but we don't, I think, ask ourselves that question enough. So what are the conditions around that change intervention that need to be true to allow that change to continue? Systems have inherent energy. They will ping back to where they started. And so self-sustaining catalytic change becomes really important when designing for systems change. So Forum for the Future and Systems Change, this is our theory of change. It is really simple. Um, we've had huge bust-ups about this. It's too simple. It's too boiled down. Um, the original version had accounted 42 arrows on it. Our trustees said, that is unintelligible. Fair enough. But don't you understand how that bit connects to that bit that connects to that? Sally, we don't understand it. OK. <laughs> Try this. Um, and effectively, what we're saying is that we convene collaborations. We partner with individual organizations to drive their own strategic interventions. We then inspire and equip leaders across all sectors of all ages to think and act systemically using our systems change tools, our futures tools. That then, we hope, drives progress on sustainability issues and builds the capacity of individuals and organizations to think and act for systems change. And all of that, we hope, 
delivers this, a sustainable future. That's it in a nutshell. Um, as you imagine, it's much more complex than that. But what's really great for us now, we've simplified this, actually even our own staff understand it more. And so when we're making decisions about what we do and what we don't do, this is really helpful as a guide to um, help make those decisions. Now, the multi-level perspective. Who's familiar with this? Again, quite a few of you. Um, this kind of sits underneath our theory of change, and I know it has its origins in academia, and I apologize if what I'm about to do now is to oversimplify it. Um, but actually, we have found that this model is really useful, um, both for us to understand at Forum how we can design for change, but also to explain to others how change happens. And it's just been really powerful in all of our collaborations to help people understand their role in driving systems change. And it also helps us understand our futures work better. So historically, we had our futures work, we had our systems work, and actually the MLP gives us a lens to talk about our futures work because we can say that there are a number of trends operating at that landscape level that are slow moving, but are profound in their influence on the world around us. So climate change, population change, demographic change. Then in the regime, there are a number of trends such as changes in legislation, changes in reporting requirements that influence our day to day, but they don't profoundly change the day to day. And then there's always a bunch of weak signals in any futures exploration. So signs of the future, um, and you know, a quote that we use a lot by William Gibson, the science writer, is the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And so what we're looking for all the time is signs of the future that then if you can scale into, regi into the regime, you can then begin to repattern the regime. And so we talk about systems change being the moment where those landscape level pressures are really bearing down on our day-to-day -day operation, often coupled with innovations that are scaling up from the niche, but critically combined with individuals that want to do something differently and feel inspired to do something differently, then you start to get a shift in the regime and the system changes. And so our work is about understanding what are those big landscape level trends, how can we respond to them, where are those innovations bubbling up from the niche, and who are those people that really want to see something different? How can we as forum work with them to start to shift systems? The next slide is a bit much, I apologise. Oh, look at that! Um, we can share all of these afterwards. Um, but I use this because I'm going to come back to it and describe how our collaborations map onto this. But that model is really, really useful as a kind of conceptual way of describing how systems change. But my nine bubbles are more useful because they describe different strategies you can use in any subsystem or system to change that system. And we've mapped them according to the different phases of system change. So at the startup phase of systems change, you have to create a robust case for change. We sometimes forget that. Um, we need to allow information to flow equi equitably so people can start to see that information and make decisions accordingly. Creating collaborations, I'm going to come back to that. That's where I'm going to take a deep dive. Um, creating new innovations and, and often disruptive in their nature. That is a sign that the system is beginning to change. We then have the acceleration part of systems change where culture, behaviours, mindsets are shifting. Without that mindset shift in particular, systems just won't change at all. I've learned that the hard way. I've run numbers of projects where we've got really close to breakthroughs in terms of a new innovation, a new way of doing things, and it hasn't seen its way through because I forgot that actually people were approaching that experiment with the same mindset that they had before. It's very sober at that, so I'm very much more careful about this these days. We then need to create the right incentives and business models and financing. That's the bit at the moment everyone is struggling with because the current way the market is operating can often be counter to sustainable developments. And then as we start to move from that acceleration to stabilization of the new system, we absolutely need the right policy frameworks. 
We need new rules of the mainstream, new measures, new goals, a new paradigm, and we need to have enabled those innovations to scale. So for us at Forum, for anything that we embark upon as a project that when we're designing, we say, okay, which of these levers are we pulling? And we, we as Forum, for example, don't really pull that policy lever at all. What are, what are we pulling? And then to the introductory remarks, who's pulling the other levers in the system and how can we work together with them so that between us, we're not pockets of isolated practice, actually we are all knowingly pulling these different levers and by knowing that we're pulling them, we're creating additionality and we're increasing our chances of changing the system. So this is just a way of mapping what's happening in a system and understanding the different strategies as distinct from leverage points, which Anna's going to talk to you about this afternoon. So deep diving into collaboration. The reason why we focus so much on collaboration at Forum is because we can see there's a huge amount of innovation out there. And if I'm really honest, I suspect we've got most of the solutions we need for big issues around climate change. They're just not scaling. And I like the analogy of um, Mr. Evil. There is a load of good practice going out there, but it's not joined up. And so collaboration for me personally is such a brilliant way of providing a safe space in a system where as forum we are agnostic about standards, we're agnostic about the polarizing issues. All we care about is accelerating progress towards sustainable development. Collaboration is when we can provide a safe space in a system to bring all these different actors together, to invite them, to build their trust, to share what they're doing, and actually you suddenly get a situation where these individual pursuits are now more than the sum of their individual parts. And that's why, for me, collaboration is so important. It's also a lot easier to say than actually do. Um, and so what I'm going to share with you is how we approach collaboration. Probably the more interesting bit is what I've learned along the way um, and the bumps in the road, of which there have been many. Um, so the process, always a process at Forum. We are process key, that's not a word, but we love process. Um, and so essentially all of our collaborations in some way, shape or form follow this process. So confirming the need, is there a problem that needs to be solved? Um, and here importantly, there's a kind of question underneath that, is there a problem that needs to be solved? Yes. Is someone else already solving that problem? If the answer is yes, go and talk to them. Because what I really see happen is a world of a thousand collaborations flowering. And so when collaborations reach that point where change is needed to happen and where the inherent resistance in any system kicks in, we give up sometimes because it gets really hard. And so we go and start something new. And so actually at the moment, I think there are too many collaborations and we need to be really sure, do we need to start something new or can we go and work with someone else that's already got something and supercharge it and actually work with them to make it more effective. So confirm the need, convene the partners, bring together the initial partners for whom this is a burning issue, scope and diagnose, critically ask the right question. So we have a collaboration looking at sustainable cotton and the first question that people came to us with was, well, is fair trade cotton better than organic cotton, better than better cotton initiative cotton, better than Uds cotton? There are at least 20 different cotton standards. And we said that's, we, with all due respect, we don't think that's the right question. The right question is, how can we accelerate sustainable cotton so that it becomes the norm? Standards are a way of doing that, but actually, how do we make sustainable cotton the norm so that, so that conventional cotton production, with all of its negative social and environmental impacts, becomes a thing of the past? So, scope and diagnose, this is where we usually do systems mapping, but not always, um, but we try and make sure we're asking the right question, and the question is at the right level of the system. Explore emerging futures, I've talked to you already about why we use scenarios. A brilliant way of changing mindsets. Sometimes people find it really hard to reimagine their organization or reimagine their products and services, particularly in business where the pressure is on short-term quarterly returns and everyone's running to stand still. 
but putting someone into the future, saying, this is what it could be like. Just imagine. Then their mindset begins to shift, usually. Um, we then align around a vision of what good looks like. We then create strategies to deliver that vision. And then we begin to take collective action. So at stage seven, that's often <coughs> when collaborations begin to falter. Because you're asking people to do things differently, you're asking for different investment patterns. Um, and if that collective action then begins to work, we've really learned, and I've learned this the hard way, step eight, it's really obvious, um, but we don't do it enough. So we sometimes think, great, we have got innovations coming to market, we have got new social structures emerging, this collaboration has been successful, we can point to change in the system. But back to the self-sustaining point, if there isn't a deliberate mechanism in place to keep that change moving forward, then it may disappear. So maintaining momentum becomes really important. So what have I learned along the way? Um, governance for any collaboration, critical. Who has decision-making rights? Who has advisory rights? Who, what is the role of the funder versus the role of the advisor? Takes time to establish this, can cause arguments at the very beginning of a collaboration, but better to have those arguments at that point in the process. Understand power, <coughs> influence, and beneficiaries. Who has the power in the system? Who has the influence? They may be completely different from the beneficiaries of <coughs> the people we're solving the problem with. So for example, in the agricultural space, a lot of the collaborations we see, where's the farmer? They're not at the table. And so with our cotton project, we've deliberately brought the farmer voice into the collaboration. So be really clear, who is the beneficiary of the system change we're designing for? And have they got a voice? Because often in these collaborations, there are some unheard voices that never make it through. So really understand power, influence, beneficiaries, and make sure there's a space for everybody to contribute. Expect resistance. Um, one of my career highlights was being threatened with prison, um, which came through one of our early collaborations in the dairy sector here in the UK. Dairy farming in the UK is a bit miserable. It's a bit better now. I think we did create some change there. Um, but we were suggesting a completely different market mechanism for dairy farming. Um, and that ran counter to what the trade associations wanted. And actually, the head of the trade association said, this is anti-competitive. You could end up in prison for breaching EU competition law. I was like, OK. I just want you to agree to this vision. Um, but expect resistance and come up with strategies to deal with resistance. And also acknowledge that, and a bit like Greta's tweets at the moment, if someone's actually criticizing the way I look, they've run out of things to say. And so if someone is really shouting at you, I now understand that is a sign of success. It means they've understood I'm serious, we're serious, and something's about to change. And then if they start to get misogynistic on top, then I'm now really brilliant. We're close. So um, patience is totally needed in these, in these situations. And brilliant process is needed. Sometimes we try so hard to get the right people in the room. We're delighted. We have the system in the room. We're like, yay! And then there's no process. And then the system leaves the room, and nothing changes. And we underestimate, I think, the power of a really great process. Encourage ego-free zones. Mm -hmm. This is a real issue in collaborations. Um, and often you find that one of the biggest barriers to effective collaborations is people are not willing to let go of their model, their process. And so that's a game where futures becomes really powerful because aligning around a vision of what good looks like, it allows you to put your ego to one side to some extent. Language really matters, sustainable development, systems change, system innovation, it is jargon soup. And when you're talking to decision makers in a bank, talking to decision makers in, gov in government, you can see them going, I really have no idea what they're talking about. And so being really clear and where you can using plain English, please, um, it's a barrier. Our language can be a barrier. Um, and then finally, I think you 
you said at the beginning, it's all about humans. These collaborative processes, they work or they fail dependent on how much trust you've brought in the process. And if there's no trust in a collaboration, it's not gonna go anywhere. And so ultimately these collaborations about that human to human contact and that human to human understanding, in my humble opinion. So just finishing up then, in terms of kind of the shifts that we need to think about as we move from designing for incremental small change to designing for systems change, is we need to understand our system. We need to move from short-term incremental solutions to sets of interventions and experiments based upon that shared diagnosis of what needs to change, working with the system. And then moving from linear plans towards definitive goals, which is kind of where everyone likes to be, to actually, we've just got a few hypotheses that we want to test here. So we think that this market mechanism will work, but maybe it won't, so let's test it. And then moving from certainty and order, which humans like quite a lot, to actually being a bit more comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. So does any of this actually change systems? So it's all very well, but as Sally, have you actually changed, you know, is there any change you can point to? And this was probably for me when I pulled this together. Um, in my, I haven't given quite this talk before, so this is for you today. Um, I said, you can't actually just, just <coughs> does it really add up to anything? So back to my bubbles. Um, I've decided that it does work to a point. And some of the examples I've got here, so creating a robust for change, we did a project eight years ago in sustainable tourism, tourism 2023. You can see we also need a branding expert. Our projects are a thing, so commodity, cotton, dairy, tourism, and a future date. So I'm quite consistent. And you can, I, when I was doing this yesterday, I think, God, we really need to think differently about how we name things. So tourism 2023, almost 10 years ago, you might have heard on Tuesday, Prince Harry launched a new sustainable tourism initiative in Amsterdam. Part of the reason the Royal Foundation got interested in this was the work we did so long ago, where we made a case for change. Um, and similarly with Dairy 2020, I mentioned my prison that, um, experience not, um, but actually that was 10 years ago. And if I look now at the UK dairy sector, the contracting mechanism has actually changed. And that's not down to us. As we all know, system change is not linear, it's not causal, it's not temporal. But I think we've done a good job in some systems around creating the case for change. Equitable flows of information as a means of understanding how to shift systems. We have an amazing project run from our Singapore office, Decent Rural Living Initiative, where we're working with palm oil growers in Indonesia, focusing particularly on labor rights for women palm oil workers. And that project is providing equitable information right now, and it's beginning to shift how the palm oil system is operating in Indonesia. Innovation, we have a big collaboration called the Protein Challenge, where we're working with all sorts of actors in the global protein system to solve for the issue around access to protein for a growing population. We have innovated new ways of animal feed, we've innovated uh, new plant-based proteins diet. Again, not on our own, but that, I think has helped create a much greater awareness of how plant-based proteins can be part of our diet. I talked about tea, I've talked about cotton. With Cotton 2040 right now, see, same naming, naming typology, um, we have got a big grant application into experiment with a different business model for sustainable cotton, which I think could be important. And then the one project that we have actually gone as far as influencing policy was here in the UK, a community energy pro pro project where we actually influence government legislation and our community energy here in the UK is scaling. Beauty and personal care accelerator, just an example of the strategy around rules, measures and standards. A piece of work that we did in the US with all of the big brands, so L'Oreal, um, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, <coughs> Again, I got shouted out in this project, but not, not threatened with prison, which was quite a relief because actually the US system is not quite like the European system. Um, but the reason for being shouted at was because we said there needs to be a different way of putting ingredients into these products. Some of the products you're putting, sorry, some of the ingredients you're putting in products that you're putting on your skin in the US, they have chemicals in them that are illegal in Europe. 
they need to come out of the everyday products. And so that project was all about redefining the ingredients of everyday products. And now it's been rolled out through the entire industry. So my conclusion is that I can point to changes in systems and subsystems. My overarching conclusion is that's OK, but it's not enough. If we really have got 10 years to kind of repass and rewire our systems, then this is OK, but not sufficient. Yes, that's what I meant to say. So for me, it's all about the question I'm carrying is, how do, I, how do we accelerate this? And then, oh, we know this. You can't change this and not change the further. But, um, you know, all that. Um, but what I wanted to ch share with you was um, my three practices. Because um, I, I have changed my approach to how I go about what I do in my everyday life. And I think I boil them down to three questions that I ask myself the whole time. So am I locking in an unsustainable system and perpetuating the status quo? Because if I'm really honest and look back at the work I did 20 years ago in business on sustainability, for a time I was just locking in the existing system. You know, I put in CSR policies, but I was locking in the way in which that business operated. And I realized that that may have slowed down the pace of change, and that's hard. But it means that I carry this question as a live question with me the whole time. Because what I want to be doing is to create a new way of organizing. And my second question that I'm asking myself in terms of designing change interventions Am I designing for transformational change? Is it catalytic? Will it be self-sustaining? And our projects are getting better as a result. Because I can design for incremental change, but that's not going to be enough. And then finally, have I left my ego at the door? And this is tough, because I'm sitting often in meetings where I'm thinking, well, what I think is, and I think, what does the system need? What does the world need? And it, it might not be what I think I need, but actually what has to come first is designing for a sustainable world. And my ego needs to come second. Thank you very much.